Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Chris Herman, and I'm here to present my personal communications project. Um, well, I'll be doing it in several segments just to keep the file sizes to manageable levels. So um, let's do the next slide, please. Okay, the theme of my presentation is interpersonal communication. Uh, how to develop and maintain essential communication skills for the facially disfigured and create a new self-identity when the old one has been destroyed. Um, as you can see, my face um, is uh, partially paralyzed so uh, from, from Bell's palsy. So I'll, I'll be uh, <clears throat> uh, explaining how that affects my life and uh, the, in, the personal communi interpersonal communication difficulties that creates and how this course material uh, will help me overcome some of those difficulties. <clears throat> so what is my overarching theme here? Well, according to the Bible, Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Um, and as a child of creation, God promises us a plan to achieve well-being. And as for me, uh, my purpose in life is to love others um, and the best way for me to help others is to testify to the healing uh, that God's presence offers uh, from a state of brokenness, how we can move from a state of brokenness to one of good health and well-being. Um, next slide. So I'm going to end this, this uh, um, portion here and we'll continue the next and continue on. Hello again. So how do, how do we develop and maintain essential communication skills for if you're facially disfigured? First of all, who suffers from facial disfigurement? Uh, people who have suffered from birth defects or later in life, uh, burn victims, auto and industrial accidents, gunshot and knife wound, can wounds, cancer, tumors, infections, stroke, uh, severe acne, and uh, paralysis victims such as multiple sclerosis, um, Bell's palsy, and various autoimmune responses that affect the facial nerves. Next slide, please. Uh, why have I chosen this topic? Well, for the last three years, I've suffered from facial paralysis caused by Bell's palsy and am still in the process of healing. Um, the most significant effect for me were slurring my speech, uh, which required me to uh, leave my occupation as an oral English language teacher. Um, my face has improved quite a bit, but um, in the past, this is all we could talk about. This, so, this is, I could not talk because this, so, this, so, this is so paralyzed. I had drooling and uh, food was coming out of my mouth while eating. Um, it was not a pretty sight to eat, see when, um, when I was eating. I was unable to close my eyelid. This went all the way. I can now, but uh, it's still not in coordination with the other one. Um, my eye was constantly dry and irritated. There was a period of at least six months where I had to be, uh, I had a constant feeling of an eyelash uh, uh, rubbing against my eyeball, uh, and that was just uh, driving me crazy. Um, <clears throat> there was diminished reading capacity. My affected eye would not coordinate with my good eye, and my reading slowed to about half speed. Um, and it was a major chore to read. Uh, there was considerable facial pain as my muscles had atrophied and the paralyzed muscles would often go into uh, spasms. Um, next slide, please. So I can testify that with all those troubles going on, your inter interpersonal communications suffer. So a person has to find ways to compensate and somehow increase their skills. A person with facial difference has to learn to overcome difficulties such as societal stigmas, uh, speech impediments, lowered self-esteem, and the negative reactions from others. Um, when your old self-image or personal identity has been destroyed, how do you go about creating a new one? Is it possible um, to create a new, compelling new future? Um, well, according to the National Institute of Health, Bell's palsy afflicts approximately 40,000 Americans every year. It affects men and women equally and can occur at any age, but it's less common before age 15 or after age 60. Um, for this, for, for most, this ailment is temporary, but for a few, 
residual effects can last for many years or for once a lifetime. So this has been three years for me. Um, next slide, please. Okay, here's some photos of how I had a beautiful smile um, before my affliction, and then my face uh, the week after it. Um, I, it was expressionless, a drooping eye and a drooping mouth. Um, about two years, here's another photo of about two years later, about, about a year later, um, still paralysis, but uh, improved, and, here's, and here I am today. Um, so you can kind of see the, the migration that I've, uh, I've had to experience. Uh, next slide, please. Um, first, uh, I want to bring, I did some research on, um, on this particular topic. And um, there was a paper written by uh, Stone and Wright who evaluated people depicted with facial disfigurement and compared them with those, those with people with mobility impairment. And um, what they studied was people with real, people's opinions of, about people in wheelchairs versus people with disfig facial disfigurement. And the results suggested that uh, attitudes were more negative towards people with facial disfigurement than with wheelchair users. And as a consequence of that, that study, uh, social norms are perceived to permit more discrimination against people with facial disfigurement than against wheelchair users. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I've included another research paper by R. Jaspa, who uh, identifies the challenges of coping, strategies for coping um, for uh, people with fa facial disfigurement. And um, according to identity process theory, uh, they, people will use several, include several coping strategies. Um, but the, the main point of that particular research is that with support from um, the community and um, the social group, um, people can live a fairly normal life. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to end this right now, and we'll do another segment soon. Next. Hello again, this is the third segment. I'm going to go pretty fast now. Um, we've got approximately um, three minutes. Um, so what did I learn from the course materials that are applicable to my own situation and will help to improve my success with my interpersonal communications? Well, um, the, according to Stuart, which was one of the texts used, uh, Bridges Not Walls, a book about interpersonal communications, uh, the most communicate, communication is a continuous collaborative process. And the, important, the most important communication events are conversations. Um, the, as he says, the conversation is the relationship. Um, and most importantly, the more accepting of yourself, the more accepting others will be of you. Um, there are fundamental differences um, among people and they are to be respected and valued. Um, one of the uh, areas he suggests is, uh, he talks about is eye gaze, how it can help, help promote um, intimacy and trustworthiness with others. Um, but because of my facial paralysis, it becomes more important to express my feelings in, with words and body language. Uh, people don't always want to look me in the eye, um, or they get confused. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Here he talks about three phases of adjustment, a stigma isolation, a stigma recognition, and stigma incorporation. Um, we'll, um, and those are the three phases that, that they go through. Um, I really don't have enough time to go into each one, but um, we'll do the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, we'll skip this slide for now. Um, the next text was the Madeline Burley Allen listening. And she talks about three levels of listening. Level one, which is empathetic listening. Uh, level two, which is just hearing the words. And level three, which is listening uh, in spurts. So um, the goal here is to get, for everybody to get to an empathetic uh, listening level. And that's really the highest level. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there are major barriers to listening. Um, she discusses uh, defensive listening. Uh, there's a time lag factor that the average uh, talker speaks about 200 words per minute. 
but a listener can only process uh, information around 300 to 500 words per minute, so their mind is very busy while they're listening. Um, there are semantic factors, words don't always mean the same to different people. Um, and the self-conscious listener, which is, uh, can, they're preoccupied with their feelings and um, their internal thoughts rather than listening to the other person. And that's uh, something I've, I've had to deal with. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, some key ideas discussed in the book is that listening is about 40%, uh, speaking about 30%, uh, reading is 16%, and writing in, is 9%. In my own case, um, I do a lot more writing. Uh, I, th I think that's about 30 to 40 percent of my, my the way I commute my the way I relate to other people, um, and I do more listening um, and probably a lot less speaking. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, um, one of the next next slide, please. So, how do, the next book was how to solve the people puzzle by. Uh, and Understanding Personality Patterns by Mills Carbonell. Um, and briefly, um, from that I learned that I was a type C blend, that's how other people see me, and they see me as being cautious, but competent. Uh, as far as I see myself, I'm an IDS type person, um, which means I often struggle with competing and conflicting motivations and feelings. I tend to have three strong motivations. I could be dominating, inspiring, and submissive all at the same time. It's truly a paradox. How I can have all those traits at the same time, and as a result, um, most people have a hard time reading me. Um, next slide, please. Um, to be more successful in any interpersonal communications, yeah, I need to be more patient. I need to correct others with love and not get angry and upset. Uh, be more positive, open the possibilities and not just my circumstances, and build relationships with others. Find happiness apart from fulfilling my tasks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the main idea was to increase my interpersonal communications effectiveness. A person should do well to focus on their strengths, but simultaneously be aware of their weaknesses so that they are able to adjust to other personality types when engaged by them. Um, and the first, the first big step in that process is avoiding problems is self-control of your feelings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to stop here, and we'll go on to uh, another segment. Um, hello again. This is uh, the final clip of the presentation. Um, one of the uh, relevant Bible scriptures that comes to mind that, that really helped me through all these difficulties is uh, Job 42.10, and the Lord, which says, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. That's a very um, important lesson to learn. And um, next slide, please. And uh, as part of my and part of the conclusion is, as I become a better listener, I can develop even deeper interpersonal relationships. So, so based on that, um, uh, listening and helping others helps me to overcome my own interpersonal difficulties. <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, one thing I must do is to, to help with my adjustment is uh, requires a lot of inner voice work uh, where I've got to listen to positive affirmations rather than negative thought processes. Um, for example, although my affliction causes me to suffer, I am grateful that it's not worse or life-threatening and very fortunate compared to many others. So and I'm very fortunate to have uh, taken this course. Um, and it's helped me to verbalize uh, many of the things that's going on with myself. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you very much for reviewing this presentation. And just please remember that the conversation is the relationship and that our relationships between God and ourselves makes everything possible. Thank you again.